Have you ever felt an overwhelming sense of apathy toward everything? There was a point when I had a good career, an amazing partner in financial security. I have always had a background noise of carelessness towards existence. My inability to be present became overwhelming. My wife Rita often thought of my disposition as emotional unavailability. Still, um, she understood my persistent melancholic mood lent itself to such a state. She really held it against me. Rita had a remedy to it all. She was the first to present the idea of us going on vacation to New Orleans. She wanted us to see the Jazz Museum, the St. Louis Cathedral, and Jackson Square. I was less than enthused about a plane flight to see monuments that we could look at in documentaries. She managed to soften my narrow-minded cynicism one day. She reminded me that Sazerac cocktails would be available everywhere there. An excuse to do nothing but drink for a week straight made the trip seem much more worthwhile. We stayed at a place called the Trident Inn. We had our fill of seafood within the first hour of landing. We visited the French Quarter, and I was far more smitten with the place than I could have ever anticipated. The pure freedom in those streets, it's palpable. I want to go back to the hotel, Rita said as she tugged at my jacket. I gave her cash for a cab and told her how I saw a few lined up three streets back. You can't be serious, she said. Let's go together now. I'm cooped up all day in my job. This is the first time in a while that I have the chance to get some fresh air and see new sights. Let me enjoy it. I'll be back in the room in an hour. I want to hit up a few more bars. She agreed with reluctance and walked away, following the directions that I had given her. I wandered down the leaf-strewn streets lined with Creole and Greek Revival-style buildings. I found a small entrance at the bottom of a flight of stone steps in an alleyway. The threshold was luminescent. I entered it. A small crowd of people holding highball glasses commiserated. They looked at me with a bit of apprehension. A stranger in their domain. The interior had the scent of pumpkin candle wax. The place looked like a 1920s speakeasy. Advertisements on the counters were of vintage products. Pictures on the wall were of the swing era. The telephones in the corners were gold-laden and had a mechanical dial. I sat down. A bow-tied and mustached bartender greeted me. I ordered an old-fashioned whiskey. I looked around between sips and saw a booth that stood out amongst the others. A neon sign which said, Psychic, in bold letters, faced me. I decided to pay for what I presumed was a theatrical parlor trick. I got comfortable in a chair across from her. I had never done this before, but the liquor made me feel a little loose. How much for a reading? She gave me an estimate of $50. I left my bills on the table and she took them. The act of divination she performed next it took me by surprise. She pulled out a piece of what I realized was animal bone. She brought out a small oil bowl and lit its surface on fire. The staff and patrons acted nonplussed despite my terror. What would you like to know about your eminent future? Is my real estate business going to boom within the next half year? I asked. She retrieved the bone with a long pair of pliers. As she took it out, she gazed at it for 30 seconds. Your business is going to fail because 
You are to die within the next two months, she said. I don't know how, but that is the time frame given by the spirits. I tried to tell myself that the woman was more than likely just a con artist. A smoke and mirrors, a touring road magician. Rita and I walked through Louis Armstrong Park. We got to Congo Square when she decided to comment on a change that she had noticed in me. You seem on edge, she said. We're on vacation, you shouldn't be so uptight. What's bothering you? I did not want to tell her how my interaction with the clairvoyant last night had unsettled me. I was never the type to believe in the paranormal anyways. I knew that Rita would have been in disbelief that I had even put myself in that mystical situation. I'm fine. I lied. We were half a block away from our rental vehicle when I saw a man in a suit. He did not look like a vagabond or a homeless person due to his exquisite fashion. Still, his hair was greasy and unwashed, and his beard looked as though it had been growing out for a while. He stood next to a tree and stared at us like we were wildlife trapezing through his backyard. I called him making eye contact with us. He picked up the pace and moved towards us. I immediately had the sense that something was off about him. A scar rested above his upper lip, the obvious byproduct of a bar brawl sometime in his past. I grabbed Rita's hand and we picked up a much more hurried movement. You have an early ending. He said behind us. His tone was caustic. The specter of death is following you. I can sense it. You need to listen to me. If you ignore it, it will be at your peril. I wanted to turn around and confront him on his random gibberish, or what I was trying to interpret as such. Deep down, I felt that he was correct in his assessment. He was roughly the same size as me, so the fight would have been even in that regard. Yet I was not willing to take any risks as far as what he may have been concealing beneath his coat. I did not have anything on me that I could use to defend myself. When we got to our car, I unlocked the doors, Rita stepped into the passenger side, and I got behind the wheel. The man had followed us all the way, and he was now twenty feet apart from where we sat in the vehicle. As I pulled out of the lot, I looked in the rearview mirror at the man. He had started to sprint after us. I saw him reach to his waistband and pull out a blade. Did you make any new enemies last night? Rita asked. Don't be ridiculous, I said. I've never met him before. As I pulled out of the lot, I looked in the rearview mirror at the man. He sprinted after us. I saw him reach to his waistband and pull out a blade. As I brought us to the highway, man, we escaped. While in bed that night at the hotel, she wrapped her arms around me and squeezed my body tight. What happened today? It bothers me, she said. I try not to worry about it, I said. We did the right thing in removing ourselves from the situation. If I had engaged him, he would have stabbed me or you or the both of us. He seemed so confident in what he was saying. It's like he knew something that we didn't. That's what crazy people do, I said as I looked into her eyes. He would have said the sky is purple with equal conviction. Don't let him rent space in your head. He's just a random psycho. She never told me that I had calmed her down, but her demeanor indicated that my pep talk had worked. We both fell asleep in our embrace. 
We went to Lake Pontchartrain the next day. We stepped out of the car and took in the sights. We knew that we had about a mile to walk before we could set up our picnic supplies. I stared at Rita as she grabbed the basket and blankets from our trunk. I took in the sight of her flowing dark hair and emerald eyes. It occurred to me at that moment just how stunning she was. For everything I did in the fast-paced life, it made me take her natural elegance for granted. A car sped towards us and hit her. It was a cream-colored Cadillac that came from behind where I stood. Its metal glinted in the sunlight as it revved into high gear and clipped Rita on the side. She managed to escape into our vehicle. She crawled into the fetal position and scrunched up tight enough to fit into the trunk. She released a scream. The Cadillac hit the main road again. I was full of anger, adrenaline, and terror. I did all I could think of at that moment, which in retrospect it seemed pathetic. I took off my shoes and threw them at the fleeing car. I looked at the driver's seat. It was the same man in the suit. The local police came out and took a report. They asked me if I had managed to catch the license plate, which I had not. And they also told me that there were no cameras in the area since it was so remote. Of course, there was also no eyewitness testimonies. I gave them the best description of the individual that I could. I hoped they would tell me that they had a regular troublemaker matching the description. But they gave me a blank expression as they had no idea who I was talking about. The paramedics assessed Rita and found that she had had a crushed foot. They took her to the hospital and they offered an ambulance ride but I drove her after they gave me a map. All they could think about was finding the man and beating him into oblivion. We returned home with my wife's foot in a cast. It felt as though that I had failed her as a man. My guilt overcame me, especially when I had to push her wheelchair. We were on the plane and in the air. I looked around at the other passengers to make sure the man in the suit was not sitting anywhere. When we got back to her house, she looked at me with sadness. Well, we should never go on vacation again. She said. I let her words hang in the air. I could not bring myself to disagree. I paid attention to the date of my prophesied death. Those numbers hung heavy around my neck. I always wondered how a free criminal must feel when he knows that there is a warrant out there for his arrest. I always ruminated on how that must be an extreme way to live or feel. I held the notion that the outlaw had it easy compared to me. By then, I already had resigned myself to any potential destructive fate. But then the day passed. When I got home from the office, I looked everywhere online for the phone number of that one speakeasy that I had stumbled into that fateful day. I searched for different psychic services in New Orleans, but I could never find it. I sought out pictures, matching the semblance of the person that I had encountered. There was no one. As time went on, I continued to lie to my wife. I told her the company they needed me to look at another property out of state and that I would be gone away from home for three days. Rita being her, she did not question me, which it made me feel even worse. I went back to New Orleans. Once I had landed, the first thing I did was go to a utility supply store and buy a couple of mace canisters. I wanted to be ready this time 
in case the man in the suit decided to stalk me again. By the time that I arrived at that old faithful speakeasy, the psychic had a line of customers when I went to see her for the second time. I sat down across from her and gave her a little bit of time to try and recognize me. Once she finally did, I spoke. I'm still alive. I knew you would be, she said. I wanted you to feel the excitement and appreciate your life for once.